Very good morning, everyone. Welcome to Global Compliance Panel's live webinar on Design History File, Device Master Record, Device History Record, and Technical File, Regulatory Documents Explained. My name is Nathan, and I'm going to be your host today. On behalf of the Global Compliance Panel team, I would like to thank you for being part of this event. Today's webinar will be presented by Mr. Jeff Kassoff. Mr. Jeff Kassoff is the Director of Quality at Medivators, a leading manufacturer of endoscopy and colonoscopy devices, where he oversees the operation of the quality system. In this position, Jeff is responsible for oversight of the document control system, including maintenance of regulatory documentation. Prior to this, Jeff spent 13 years at LifeTech as the Director of Regulatory Affairs, where he was responsible for compliance of the corporate quality system. Jeff received his regulatory affair, affair certification in 1996. We are honored to have such a distinguished person such as Jeff Kassar with us to present this webinar today. Uh, so before we begin, I would like to inform you about the program outlined for this training session. This webinar is for 60 minutes duration. First, Jeff will take you through today's webinar, highlighting the areas that would be covered, and then he would share with you his presentation. We would like to inform you that all the participants who once part of the teleconference have been placed on mute and will remain so until the QA window begins towards the end of this webinar. Meanwhile, during the session, if you have any question, please feel free to send your question to me over the chat. Ten minutes of time will be allocated for question and answer, during which your questions will be answered toward the end of the session. If for any reason you get logged out of this training session or teleconference, please follow the same procedure to join in again. Now, as we are all set uh, to start, I would request Mr. Jeff Kassoff to take it from here. Mr. Kassoff? Thank you very much for the introduction. Let me welcome everybody to the webinar. For those of you who have not attended webinars in the past, I think really the only downside you'll find is that I can't see you and you can't see me. The way I like to address that is at the end of the webinar, it, sure, we'll have a Q&A session, but I'd like to almost have a discussion, if that's what you want. What I'm trying to say is that I'm open to entertaining any sort of interaction that you're interested in. As the moderator said, today's webinar is about DHF and DMR and DHR and TF, just you know, the whole pile of documents. Just as an aside, I've seen, you know, I, I work with some people in the industry who in other companies who have tried to make as much of this electronic as possible, and that's that's absolutely fine. Be aware, though, if you you will need some signatures for quite a few of these uh, documents. For example, your uh, DHR review need, will need to be signed. You'll need to have a signature of that. Um, in many cases, your DHF will have phase reviews, and those that information will need to be signed. It's okay to sign a piece of paper and then scan it and retain that scanned copy as the original. But just be aware of the uh, 21 CFR Part 11 electronic requirements implications. And obviously there's webinars upon webinars on CFR Part 11, but I just wanted you to be aware that it's allowed, but at the same time you've got to take care to make sure that you comply with a whole new slew of regulations. First, we'll cover the DHF, and from a requirement perspective, the DHF just describes the design history of the device. We'll talk a little more later about the utilization of the term history as far as design history of a device. Suffice it to say that the design of your device does not end when the device is first implemented and handed to production and the R&D or new business development guys, engineers, are finished with that, your design is going to move forward. And for whatever reasons, perhaps field reports or in process non-conformances or even cost savings, that design is going to change. So therefore, the history will, of that document, let's just say that the, this document is a, the DHF is a living document. In 82030J, it requires that you establish a DHF for each type of device. That is not each device. It is no requirement that you have one of these for every single device. It's okay to organize your DHF by product family as long as it's by each type of device. The DHF has got to contain 
or reference records that show that your designs would, was developed, two things here, per your own internal approved design plan and the external regulatory requirements. So ordinarily what happens during an FDA inspection is that the inspector will look at your standard operating procedure for design control and they will compare that procedure to, they will make sure that procedure includes the requir uh, requirements contained in the uh, QSR. And then they're going to look at the, your design history and make sure that your design history was developed per, per your own internal design plan. The DHF, look at the first two words here, can contain or reference. I've seen it both ways. I've seen DHFs that are enormous, that are several in some cases, a bookshelf's worth of three-inch wide binders. I've also seen it that the DHF references locations of other documents. That's okay, as long as you reference either subdirectories or folders, if you keep maintain them electronically, or a department location. Just as an interesting aside, the concept of the, of the DHF is peculiar, is specific to domestic requirements. There's no requirement in 9001 or 1345 for the design history file. But you will see when we look at the technical file that there's a lot of crossover between the two. The, the rationale for maintaining, for having a DHF, is that the design control regs tell us what we need to document. And the DHF is a compilation pile of, the, of these documents. Um, there's no requirement for where you maintain your DHFs. I, I've seen it all over the place, quite honestly. Uh, what I think I see a little more prevalent than any other is that when it comes to simple designs, the designer assembles the DHF and in many cases actually maintains the DHF. This, this sometimes works really well because I've always been a big fan of ownership. So if there's a designer who is the project manager on a simple design project, and they're responsible for maintaining and updating, therefore, the DHF, that really creates ownership and responsibility in the designer's mind, as opposed to designers who may have, you know, may go ahead and when they're finished with the design, they're just dumping it off. They're not following up at all. I've seen it the other way. I've seen all designs and all projects maintained in document control. Uh, when it comes to larger projects, that's usually where document control is established for these documents and the files are maintained in a, in a central location. And that location is entirely up to you. The first bullet point here where it says compilation of these records, I sort of uh, humorously referred to the concept of the pile. It's very, very important in maintaining your DHF because your DHF and to some extent your technical file are the two largest of your regulatory documents. You want to make sure that these are very, very well and very meticulously maintained and organized. Table of contents, section numbers, things like that. Something I came across many years ago at a previous company was that the DHF was maintained by the director of R&D and this gentleman was genius. He was a fantastic engineer. However, his, let's just say his organizational skills left a little to be desired. So during the FDA inspection, it became very difficult for us to organize the DHF. Se uh, section one, you know, the inputs were in several manila folders. Um, they were here and they were there. Eventually, we were able to, main to uh, obtain the overwhelming majority of the DHF, but it was very painstaking procedure. Your goal during an FDA inspection is to make the inspection go as quickly as possible because before the FDA inspection, of course, you're going to be in substantial compliance. Part of making the inspection go as quickly as possible is organization. It's very key that you organize all of your documents and the DHF is a very important document to organize. The contents of the DHF, and let me take it, just uh, jump back here. I've presented in person webinars, a two-day seminar, not a webinar, of these topics. So I've been able to, I've had the opportunity to be able to speak in depth about each of these DHF contents 
and each of the contents of the technical file, for example. Unfortunately, the duration of this webinar is such that in many cases, it's, I don't have a lot of time to cover the contents of each of these sections. So I want to apologize for not going into as in-depth as, as you might like. The contents of the DHF begins with the design input documentation. Remember, during phase review of your design control process, you've got to have these design inputs approved. So at the end of the design input documentation, you'll have signatures. The signatures of the departments are those with that your internal procedure will require, and I can guarantee you that the FDA inspector will look to make sure that you met your own internal requirements. After the input documentation, which is what does the device need to do, is the output documentation which shows that your device as designed and as manufactured meets the input requirements. I've seen a lot of good matrices in my, uh, in my experience which link inputs to outputs and you have a chart, a list of inputs and then after each input is a specific reference to the particular validation or verification or other type of evaluation that shows that a particular input requirement was met. Also in the DHF, obviously, is the design and development plans. What is it that you plan to do each of those particular phases, and not just the phases, but throughout the entire process? The plan also lists the deliverables. These are usually Gantt charts or the sort of pro Microsoft projects and things like that. When it comes to what the FDA expects to see, though, those of you who have been involved in design and development planning know for certain that your first plan is barely a plan. But as you move forward in the process, your plan becomes a little more concrete and a little easier to meet. The FDA inspector will expect to see more than one of these Gantt charts because it's part of showing your design and development plan is showing that plan as it iterates, as it moves forward and as it changes. For you to show just one plan, which is the last one, the one you met, is not really showing your planning process. Also in the DHF is the results of your design validation. Uh, remember that the design validation is different than the process validation in that the design validation shows that you met your specific input requirements and the, and the um, process validation shows that the process that you use to make your products is able to achieve the products, in our, is able to achieve those same, uh, those same requirements. The documentation of design reviews must be in your DHF also. Uh, I'm sorry, for this repeat bullet point, this one should say process validation. There are going to be times where you use automated equipment to manufacture your devices. You need to pr perform process validation on that equipment. If you do not use automated equipment and you're able to verify by inspection and not destructive testing all of your requirements, then that's okay as long as you instruct your manufacturing personnel to actually do that verification. You also, in the DHF, you also must put in uh, copies of or reference to the location of the design documents in the change control records. And a question that's often asked is, if I make changes to my design inputs, do I need to change the DHF? And the answer is yes. If in the first phase in my design input requirement, I have six design inputs, but then I realize perhaps during design output or maybe even later on that I need to add another one, I'm going to actually change the DHF, the DHF. My, set my first section of design input documentation will have you know, a version one and a version two, and I'll, that, will sh that will show the inspector that I've actually continued my design and development plan throughout the process. Moving now to the DMR, the DMR is instructions on how to build your thing. The better way to look at it is if you're, instead of making a, a medical device, you're actually making a cake. So to make the cake, you have the shopping list, which is the parts that you need to put into that cake or medical device, the recipe and instructions, which is how to make that cake or device, 
And again, since the device really isn't a cake, you're going to have things like diagrams and drawings to assist you in that manufacture. The contents of the DMR begin with a product identification. There, it's, it's acceptable to have DMRs for a product family. Some people, some people choose to do that. Others choose to have their DMRs be product specific. Whichever of those you choose, it's a little easier, a little more straightforward to have it be product specific because as well as you know your devices, that's how unfamiliar with your devices the FDA inspector is. So if you're looking at uh, product number 123 and the inspector requests the DMR for that product, it's usually a little more straightforward to have the DMR for product 123 available so the inspector can actually see them, uh, see that, excuse me, as opposed to having a product family DMR of which product 123 is a component. And you can certainly explain your way through that, but again, your goal is to uh, have the FDA inspection be as short as possible. Product description is also often in the DMR. It's just a very brief blurb about the application and the intended use of the particular device. The DMR itself will have a revision history. <clears throat> Your DMR will be updated as you change components with as as you change components in the DMR in the product itself. So when it comes to revision history controlling your DMR, most firms choose to do that in as part of their document control procedures. So it's going to have a rev level, effective date, an ECO number, maybe a short description of the change if you have your change control matrix on your actual document. The DMR should also contain the shelf life of the product of which it is the DMR. When you change the shelf life, you will then sh therefore change your DMR. It's a pretty significant change to going from uh, maybe a new product introduction of one year to then having your uh, real-time or accelerated aging data for a three-year shelf life. How many units are in the shipment configuration? Do you box, is it just one unit because it's an electronic instrument, or do you box 10 or 25 per chipboard carton? The, di the, the some would say most critical part of the DMR is the documents. It's all the documents. It's document numbers and descriptions are also, uh, but no revisions. So each document, as I said earlier, does have a current rev level in history, but it's not on the DMR. So just remember that's very, very important there. On my DMR, I'm going to list the part numbers and again, include a description. But I'm not going to say when it comes to part number one, two, three, that it ha it's currently at Rev A. I'm just going to list it on the DMR. Bill of materials also is on there, which is a, 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 a list of the components, including subassemblies. Uh, those of you who work at companies where you do one piece flow have no subassemblies. Those of you who work at the more standard companies with uh, more stocking options do have sub-assemblies, but it's not just your first level it, sub, uh, bill of materials, but it's also your indented bill of materials that needs to be on there. Uh, components need to be on there, also need to be represented on there, the part number and or a drawing number, depending on how you control your components. Uh, drawings need to be referenced on there. Of course, if there are drawings that <laughs> represent the components, that's sufficient by just putting the component number on there. Some firms have, for example, a, a particular drawing that's used as an aid, uh, for perhaps in place of a manufacturing procedure. So if you use manufacturing procedures, you're going to reference MP for manufacturing procedure uh, 364, but if you have a drawing for product 364, you're going to reference that drawing instead. Quality assurance or, or test procedures, anything that's done to this device to evaluate it needs to be on here also. Any fixtures that are used, a fixture is part of the recipe. I can't make my device without this fixture that enables me to perhaps insert three of these tubes into this fixture at one time so that I can glue them to their connectors all at the same time. That fixture is key to the assembly of this device. 
uh, packaging procedure also if you do any sort of final packaging, whether you put your instrument into a particular uh, box that, is pr that includes some protection, or whether you do, as I mentioned earlier, the single uh, consumable inside a chipboard box of 10, 10 uh, 20 of which go inside a shipping carton. Labeling procedure. Some firms have labeling procedures, and other firms have documents that indicate the labels that are used. Either or both of these are included in your DMR. Your steril sterilization procedure also, that's obviously a very important part of your DMR and needs to be included in there. Make sure, and I know this from personal experience, that if you sterilize your product, you have an internal procedure that explains how you sterilize it, how you package it, how it's shipped out, how it comes back, whose responsibility it is to do the, as the next bullet point reads, post-sterilization inspection and testing to verify, you know, who verifies that the documentation has been received back from the test lab to assure that your biological indicators have been released. That all should be in your sterilization or, or another procedure. But as I said a moment ago, the post-sterilization inspection and testing needs to be in your DMR. And your shipping procedure. Some firms don't have shipping procedures. Others do. There's no explicit requirement for shipping procedures. But if you, if you have it as part of your quality system, that's something that must be included in your DMR. Now let's go to the DHR. <clears throat> the DHR is the, really the production record for the device, you know, a compilation of records, et cetera, et cetera. But what the DHR does is it shows that you met your DMR. So any records that are generated during production any testing records, any rework records, any inspection, any acceptance from manufacturer to distribution are included as part of your DHR. The regulation reads that you've got to establish and maintain procedures. So make sure you have a procedure, as ridiculous as it may sound, for what constitutes your DHR. And some firms don't call them DHRs, they call them other names. Well, if you do, make sure you have, in your, you have a procedure that it translates. Again, when the FDA inspector comes, they expect to see DHR, and if they don't see it, it's gonna, it might take you a few moments or a little while to explain to them what, you, what your DHR means. Some firms, just as a step back, when they use, uh, when it comes to DMR, they don't call their DMRs device master record, they call them bill of materials. And those bill of materials certainly also contain the procedures. It's a little more than just your standard bill of materials, you know, list of parts. But it, it's a electronic, in many cases, bill of materials that can, has the contents of the DMR. It references the procedures and things like that that are used to make that device. Another example of translation that's necessary. So each bat, each lot, each unit, everything has to have a DHR. Even if it's an accessory, some firms make simple cables that are used to connect their product to any commercially available instrument that's out there. That needs to have a DHR. Even if you don't lot control it, you've got to have a DHR for all products that you make. <clears throat> you've got to be able to demonstrate that your DHR requirements meet the requirements in the regulations, but you've also got to make sure to show that your DHR meets the requirements in the DMR. Now, I want to spend a few minutes talking about this because what the FDA does from time to time is they look at your DHR. Some people call them routers or something like that. And in many cases, the steps are kind of simplified. The step one is issue parts and somebody initials and dates next to that. And then it's uh, you know, assemble parts, inspect parts, and everybody, you know, the appropriate people initial and date next to this, you know, send, for, you know, uh, send for sterilization, receiving inspection, release to release to stock. That's what the simplified router looks like, and many people include that as part of their DHR because it shows the process. It shows that 
the, your processes, the processes that you expose this product to meet the requirements in the DMR. Well, you know what? It doesn't show that at all. Your DMR says, I'm going to assemble this product. I, I, it says, I'm going to issue these parts per this procedure, and I'm going to assemble the product according to these two procedures, because maybe it's a little complex product, and I'm going to inspect per this particular drawing, then I'm going to sterilize for this sterilization procedure, I'm going to receive it back and do my final uh, inspection and verification per this other procedure, and then I'm going to stock it per this stocking procedure. Well, there's nothing on the DHR example that I gave you that includes reference to any of these procedures. So therefore, you've not shown, you've not met this requirement. You've not shown that your DHR shows that you demonstrate that the device is manufactured in accordance with your DMR. So review your DHR, your routers, and make sure that they reference the procedures. It's not necessary to reference rev levels, but just the actual procedures that are used. The DHR either has to include or refer to the location. When it comes to a DHR, even though we have the option to refer to the location, in most cases, I like to have my DHRs all in one place. Even for the more complex pieces of equipment, we, have, we uh, manufacture a large endoscope reprocessor, which has hundreds of parts in it. Even having said that, and quite, and quite a few procedures also, even that, I like to have the DHR in one location. It's very easy to reference, and, it's, and since the DHR is product-specific, it's unit-specific, you don't really get that much out of referring to locations of things. So the DHR has got to have when you manufacture it, in other words, when each production step was performed, the quantity manufactured, which is in everywhere from how many parts were issued to how many products yielded through a particular process, and then how many products yielded, you know, how many were released for distribution, how many yielded outside of the process. Here's what I mentioned earlier, spend a few minutes talking about the acceptance records. I have to show that your device is assembled per the DMR, and you've got to make sure to do this. The label or labeling that are used, that's used for each unit has got to be in the DHR. You have a choice here, and your choice is to either include a label sample. So if you're making a thousand pieces, you print a thousand and one labels, and you include that label sample with your DHR. But what's missing when you do that, which is why in some cases many people choose to, when having to choose between the label sample or, as it reads here, the inspection record of labels, most many companies I know choose to do the, both of these at one time. And they print out an extra label, and they take that label and they put it on a sheet of paper. and they, on that sheet of paper, they have a, uh, an inspection record. So they have a signature by an inspection personnel, a QA person, that shows that that person inspected that label. That's the clearest way I know of to meet this requirement. And device control numbers, if applicable. If you have lot number of, comp if you lot number components, due to whatever reason you choose to do that, that's got to be indicated in your DHR. Just as an aside when it comes to lot numbering of components, there's no regulatory requirement for medium, for moderate risk devices, that is. Let me just take it a step back there. That you lot control every single component you issue. A good way to distinguish it is that take a look and evaluate risk. What is the risk of a particular component not working? If it doesn't work, what is the risk to the patient, or what's the risk to the efficacy of the product? And control that way. So you're issuing lot numbers to only these, I'll use the word critical, but back in the day, there was a distinction in the uh, FDA regs about critical components and critical devices. So I'm not using that definition, I'm just using the word critical, which means important. So. I recommend that when it comes to lot numbering of components, you only lot number those components that you consider to be critical. Just uh, end, end aside there. 
the DHR contents are the part number, the work order number, and quantity or lot number. Some firms have work order number and lot number be the same thing. Others have them be two different pieces of information. Each sequence that was performed and the initials of the employee who completed each operation. Some companies have a quandary here. And these are the companies that make lar very large quantities of their products, usually uh, sterile consumables, things like that. So if this company is making 10,000 pieces, chances are that this particular operation sequence was performed simultaneously by many people. Each of those people has got to initial, at least, next to the blank. And it's okay that, you know, they're a read eight initials on one particular date for one particular operation. Any subcontracted operations have got to be contained in, in your DHR. If you make a uh, metal connector that you send out to be coded, that process has to be referenced in your DHR. Any rework orders. Rework is a very unusual animal, especially when it comes to things like sterile consumables, because what some firms choose to do is they validate their process for 2x sterilization. Well, after they finish sterilizing once, or even in the absolute worst case, which has happened to me more than once, what happens is you get a call from your sterilizer that halfway through the sterilization process, the ETO ran out. So they need to subject that product to sterilization again. In that type of rework thing, you have to make sure that any rework steps, any additional steps over and above the standard work are captured in your DHR. Any nonconformances, discrepancy reports, or defective material transfers, anything that shows either that you issued additional parts to this job, because in many cases the component, some components were nonconforming, it might just be also that you miscounted but that defective material transfer or additional material transfer has to be recorded, as do component or in-process nonconformances or discrepancy reports, whatever you call them. And in these cases, it behooves you to include a copy of the reject report or the nonconforming report in your DHR. It might be a good, op a good opportunity to reference the original that perhaps you have in a book somewhere or something like that, but I like putting it in. Again, if I reference it, the inspector is going to want to see it. It doesn't help me to reference something when I know that the inspector is going to want to see that document. There's no additional work here for me to actually take that sheet of paper and put it in the DHR. Lot number or serial number as appropriate. If you have lot numbers or serial numbers, whichever you have, just a step back before I forget about the nonconformances. <clears throat> what I like to do when I have a nonconformance written on a particular step in my operation sequence is I indicate on my router, on my traveler, whatever you'd like to call it, which on, on the particular step, which on which step the nonconformance occurred. That's something that helps you from a trending perspective, and it also, again, makes it a little clearer for the FDA inspector. Any relevant dates, the dates the part, parts were issued, the dates the work, date the work order was completed, or the date the product went into stock, that should all be in your DHR also. <clears throat> Excuse me. Any test or inspection results need to be included in your DHR. Some firms will actually document uh, quantifiable results. Other firms merely have qualifiable results that it met a particular requirement. There's no requirement that says, if you measure something, you must document all of the dimensions, the results of all the dimensions that you measured. But you obviously have to perform that measurement. So any of the results of that, of those inspections or tests, have to be included in your DHR. At the end of your DHR, you're going to have, most firms use somebody in quality. I like doing that. It uses, continues to use quality as the gatekeeper <clears throat> and Therefore, the initials of the QA inspector, I've seen many firms that have a sheet that instructs the quality inspector what to look for, that all, all blanks are, or all appropriate blanks are signed or have NA written in them. If it's a sterile product that the sterility report has been received, there are quite a few other things. All the pages are present, and that way you have somebody reviewing and therefore accepting the work order. And some companies, produce to order. 
they know that every product they make, they make specifically to a customer's order. If that's the case, then you're going to want to include the shipping record in your DHR to verify that it went to that particular customer. Firms that make just to inventory do not need to have, obviously, a shipping record because you don't know. When, you, when I make my 10,000 pieces and put them into stock, I don't know who's buying them. The purpose for the manufacturer when it comes to the DHR is <clears throat> I'm going to be able to evaluate my product based on it, and I'm also going to be able to trace and track anything I need to with regard to quantities or lot numbers. I can trend my quality data also. When my DHR tells me where something uh, is, re the step at which something is rejected, and, and the quantity also enables me to gather that data for good corrective and preventive action analysis. It also enables you to record changes or variances in a process. Something that I neglected to mention that's got to be in your DHR is any deviations from the standard process, whether you accept something that maybe doesn't meet specifications or you assemble a product in a way that's contrary to your standard manufacturing procedure, that deviation record is going to be part of your DHR. So you can track uh, variances in your process by quantifying the amount of, of deviations that are used in it within a particular device. The DHR also lets you do problem solving when it comes to investigations or corrective actions. It's all there and it, all the documented information assists you in performing investigations for complaints, for example. From the agency's perspective, the DHR shows that you followed your own procedures and you met and, you, and your product that you made is in compliance with the DMR. Also, it, it's a good, the agency likes to throw around the term state of control a lot, and this is just a great data source for them to use to, to, qual, to qualify that. The FDA also likes to see you use your DHRs and you reference them when it comes to investigations into in process nonconformances, field reported nonconformances, and they like to see that information fed into your CAPA system. And label control, you're, you're documenting that you evaluate specific labels in your DHR, and that enables you to control them better. There are a couple other regs in which the DHR is mentioned. When it comes to traceability for implants and life-sustaining devices, you've got to document those control numbers in the DHR. When it comes to acceptance activities for receiving and in process and finished devices, those documented activities are going to be part of the DHR. Non-conforming product, specifically when it references rework, you've got to make sure when you perform a rework that you determine and you confirm that there are no adverse, there's no adverse effect from the rework upon the product. Well, <clears throat> This is going to be documented at the DHR. And the way people accomplish this is by making sure that as part of their rework, the last step is always a, an inspection or a test to evaluate, to make sure that all of the requirements have been met. Um, device labeling, any label release has to be documented in your DHR. And labeling, label and labels and labeling have to be documented in the DHR. So not just the labels, not just the stickers, let's call them, that go on your pouches or on your product, but also instructions for use and things like that. When it comes to general requirements, the anything that's there that's reasonably accessible has got to be made readily available and legible. So while not a DHR-specific requirement, remember that your DHRs have to be reasonably accessible, and they have to be made readily available if somebody wants to see them, and they have to be legible. There are many times where people, when they put sign their names or even maybe just put their initials down, it's kind of difficult to read. That legibility is often lost. And it is a regulatory requirement, as you can see here, how to get away, how to uh, get through that. Well, what many companies do is they have document control maintained in notebook, and each employee, each production employee, has a blank on that notebook, and whether it's a page or a line or a section, and their name is printed, and next to their name, they sign and they put their initials. So if those initials are illegible, 
then I'm going to go to my document control coordinator and get her book and be able to determine who those people are. So the concept of legibility just means understandability, and that's accomplished by using the document control book. You've got to keep the DHRs for a period of time equivalent to the expected life of the device, but not less than two years. Most devices have a greater than two year, <coughs> excuse me, expected life. For sterile consumables, it's their expiration date. For instruments, you've got to make sure that in your documentation somewhere, you state what the expected device life is. For those firms that pride themselves on being able to have a design that lives forever, we can, even though it's a previous design, we can service it for 20 years. Well, that's your expected device life, so you've got to maintain your DHR for that period of time. L the technical file is a document that shows how your device complies with the essential requirements. And just remember that it applies to three classes, 1, 2A, and 2B. For class 3, for design dossiers, it's the same contents as the technical file, but you submit them to your notified body prior to getting your CE marking, whereas your technical file is just, you just keep it and they review it at, during their uh, notified body audits. The structure of the technical file begins with an introduction, then the ER checklist, and then a risk analysis. It's followed by the more technical aspects of the actual device, the drawings and the design specifications and the product specifications. And then all of the chemical, physical, and biological tests, and then the clinical data. As you can see, there are quite a few sections of here. If, for example, you have no clinical data in your technical file, don't just leave uh, item six empty and make package qualification and shelf life your number six. Put a section in there for clinical, clinical data, and you can't just write the clinical data is not required. You have to explain why it is not required. Seven is package qualification and shelf life. Eight is labels, all of your instructions to use, but also your advertising materials are part of your technical file. M manufacturing sterilization, and then your declaration of conformity is your last section of the technical file. The technical file introduction <clears throat> begins with a product, product description, excuse me, and then use specifics. So as you may recall, quite a bit of this was not actually required in your design history file. Contraindications and warnings, for example. <clears throat> They are required in a technical file, but were not explicitly required in your DHF. A list or description of each of the accessories. While your accessories themselves are not medical devices per se, you've got to list them and describe them in your technical file for the particular product. What regulatory approvals you have, what domestic regulatory approvals, and per Annex 9 of the Medical Device Directive, what classification your device is. Um, completely different classifications for those of you who may be a little in, on the novice side. Classification according to the Medical Device Directive is a completely different animal than classification here in the U.S. And what conformity assessment route you choose. The essential requirements is a very long document, I'm not going to lie to you. And as I mentioned earlier, when I do the in-person seminars, I spend quite a bit of time going over the essential requirements checklist, but it's a pretty straightforward document because in one column it has each of the requirements, and in the next column, I'm oversimplifying it admittedly, in the next column it has how you comply with each of those essential requirements, which of your standard operating procedures assures that you do particular things, or which report assures that your device is safe and effective, things like that. I've given you the citation here for a sample. Risk analysis has got to be performed per ISO 14971, and it's got to have a post-market surveillance, which in many instances is a very fancy way of you know, including your complaint history for similar devices. Much of the time a device you make is going to have similar devices that you can use their complaint history in determining your post-market surveillance. And then clinical experience and clinical risks. If you don't have any, 
then you would put NA in that particular section. Section 4 of the technical file is, as I mentioned earlier, the more product-specific information. It's an in-depth description of the product. It's all of the components and materials. <clears throat> I know some firms who choose to put uh, photographs excuse me, in their technical files. A brief description of your design control practices. You can't just reference your SOP, but several sentences just of how you design control. Do you go by phase gate? If you do, what are your phases? Things like that. Any verifications or validations? This is actually a great opportunity to reference verifications or validations because in many cases you do multiple of each of these and usually some of the validations are quite extensive. So it's okay to reference them by validation number if that's how your company does that. Does that. Any quality system certificates that you have in place and <clears throat> the, uh, your notified body at this point will want to see your final product release criteria. Earlier, when we talked more domestic, we talked about the QA inspection of the finished device. That's the final product release criteria. Uh, beginning section five is your bench testing. And that's the testing you've done in-house. And you've got to have, you've got to do this per the, uh, the the DOE, uh, Design of Experiments. So you're going to start with a protocol which contains what parameters are going to be measured and how you're going to measure them, which equipment you're going to be using, and make sure that you explicitly state that that equipment must be within calibration. Your acceptance criteria, I recommend, and I see this far more often than you think, that you take the opportunity to set apart your acceptance criteria explicitly. The number of test samples you're going to use in this bench testing, including what makes you think you can choose that few devices. If you normally make products in uh, lots of a thousand, why are you only choosing six products to do this bench testing? Identification of test articles. Are you choosing finished devices? Quick, quick That's a trick question. The answer is yes. And what lot numbers are you doing? Are you do you intend to test those on multiple lots or just one lot? If you accelerated or real-time age prior to testing, you've got to include that information and what the conditions were of the accelerated age. There's a formula that you can use, but you still need to state what, uh, what the conditions were. Now that the protocol is written and approved, you're going to have your test report for your bench test, which in addition to including all of the raw data and a good interpretation of data and conclusions because pages of raw data are very difficult to understand even with a corresponding statistical analysis that you want to have here. But something I want to spend a moment speaking about is that we've got to include deviations from the protocols. There are going to be instances where your test protocol isn't entirely met. Perhaps you state that you've got to have 50 parts and they all have to pass a certain pressure test, let's say. Well, during that validation, you discovered that one of those 50 parts was assembled incompletely. They're, for example, the assembler just neglected to glue the two parts together and, and instead press fit them together. Well, that's a deviation from your protocol. So you've got to explain that in your report. And by what justification are you able to say that now 49 of those parts means that I've met my uh, acceptance criteria. And approval signatures at the end of the test reports as well. When it comes to biocompatibility, you're going to state what the categorization, what, um, what kind of, what category your device falls in by the nature and duration of the body contact in ISO 10993-1, which will also tell you what testing is required the, when it comes to the tests performed, you want to make sure that you list the tests that were performed. And in the test report, make sure the test lab accreditation is mentioned. They do this, but just make sure it's there. Um, make sure that the report also contains a description of the test sample on your sample submission documentation. Make sure you describe your test sample as completely as possible. The report should also contain a procedure and an external reference standard of what biocompatibility test was performed. And obviously then the test results. Was it non-cytotoxic, for example? 
I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about micro, microbiological safety or coded medical devices, <clears throat> other than to, with regard to microbiological safety of uh, tissues of animal origin, reference the two standards here, the three standards here, excuse me, that you can reference. And coded medical devices have their own type of testing that need to be done from a either by a compatibility perspective or efficacy perspective. You've got to make sure that when you coat your devices that they meet the requirements of, that you set, set out for them. Clinical data, interestingly enough, the standard says that it applies in particular to implantable devices in Class three, and the data has got to be based on a compilation of scientific literature or results of clinical investigations, <clears throat> but a, your clinical study, your clinical data, can be performed based on historical data. So what companies do is they rely heavily on their complaint history for either that device, if you're making a technical file after some period of time, or similar devices with an explanation of the differences between the devices. Clinical studies are now required for complete new devices, <clears throat> modified devices, in which the modification may significantly affect safety or performance. The key word in that phrase is significantly, that you're going to have to sort of rationalize in your documentation. If you already have an existing device that has a new indication, you're going to include that. You need to uh, perform clinical studies for that. <clears throat> Any new or modified body contact material you need clinical studies for. And last, uh, your device use life extension, if you go from one year to three years, for example. When it comes to packaging qualification and shelf life, <clears throat> there are three standards against which you will need to test your device. You don't need all of these, but you should have at least one of these. The more, the better. If your product is terminally sterilized, 868-1 <clears throat> and 11607 are valid. Some firms that have sterile consumables also choose to use D999. Ordinarily, though, it's relied upon by instrument manufacturers to make sure that their shipping, that their product is packaged protectively enough inside the shipping container that it comes out and it is still effective. Make sure that when you do real-time and or accelerated aging that you test your product for product conformance, but you also test and validate the shelf life. <clears throat> I've seen firms that do one of these things or the other in many cases that they'll test for shelf life and say that, well, this product is safe for three years, so we're going to give it a three-year shelf life. But what they neglect to remember is that your device also has to work over a three-year period. <clears throat> for sterile devices, just want to spend a moment or two speaking about this, you've got to describe the packaging and the packaging materials. You've got to describe or reference your process, the packaging process validation, if you use maybe a, a sealer an MPLEX sealer or something like that. Your packaging integrity test, in, by what method do you perform this integrity test? Do you perform a visual inspection, a dye penetration test, or a seal strength, maybe an Instron test, for example? How do you verify or, and or validate that your labels are stuck, that they're adhered to the product and that they're legible? Some firms have these pouches that, uh, upon which they directly print. Well, obviously, they don't need to evaluate adhesion, but I can tell you from personal experience that legibility is a key determination here. And any sort of real-time or accelerated aging studies that you've performed are going to be in Section 7 as well. Section 8 is your labeling. It's your advertising. So it's all of your labels. It's your IFUs. <clears throat> you've got to make sure in your labels and instructions for use that you comply with two standards, EN 980 and ISO 15223. Both of them deal primarily with pictures, with the graphical symbols, excuse me, that are used on your device. When it comes to language, <clears throat> it's okay to label your product with only one language, but before you ship into a particular country, <clears throat> you want to make sure that that particular country will accept English, I'm presuming that's your first language, as an acceptable language. Also, your advertising and your promotional materials have got to be contained in this section of your technical file, 
as does a reference to your website. Obviously, there's no way to put your website in this book, but you can certainly include reference to it. It is, after all, advertising material. Section 9, Manufacturing, asks you to describe your manufacturing process. Most companies just make a flow chart and they put it in the section of the technical file. If either of the following manufacturing conditions, uh, 14644 or 14698, apply to you, you've got to obviously show compliance with those standards. Um, <clears throat> if you manufacture in the same look at the same location in which you monitor or in which you manage, that's okay, but some firms don't. In this case, you've got to make sure that you have a copy of the quality system cert for that manufacturing plant. What are your label and control processes, <clears throat> excuse me, and what are your traceability processes? Make sure you explain those in this section of your technical file. Any sort of buyer burden determination you make, you've got to uh, include that here too. And if you manufacture blood, direct blood contact devices, you're obviously going to perform pyrogen testing on those products, and you've got to include that in this section as well. And any sort of preventive, any sort of SPC monitoring that you perform is going to be referenced in this section as well. In the sterilization section, you've got to make sure that your contract sterilizer or your firm, if you perform sterilization, has both EN 550 and ISO 11130 cer certifications. <clears throat> this section would also reference the location of your annual sterilization validation report. For those of you who perform these annual reports, you know that you'll get mul you can get multiple two to three inch binders. So you might as well just reference them. They're in the Director of Quality's office, for example. I was asked once to point to the regulation or standard that requires annual revalidation. And anecdotally, I can tell you that everyone I know who works at the companies that make sterile consumables does it like that. And then 11135-1 re <coughs> requires revalidation at defined intervals. The, an interesting question that I've not been able to answer is, is an inter can I say I'm going to perform revalidation when I have a uh, material change or a density change or a change to a uh, characteristic that impacts the product that is covered under my sterilization validation. I don't know. I don't know if that constitutes an interval as per 11135-1. Uh, I don't think it's worth finding this out, but I don't know the answer to the question. And you want to make sure that your sterilization plant has certification and that you, ha you have a copy of that certification and that you have an agreement with them to provide you with certification when, that certif when those current certificates expire. <clears throat> Section 11 is a declaration of conformity. If you go to this website and you search declaration of conformity, you're going to get at least a couple of dozen varieties of declarations of conformity. Choose whichever one you like the most. So <clears throat> to pull everything together, to summarize, the DHF is the product or product line specific history of the design process. I prefer to use a product line specific history because I can dis uh, differentiate in my DHF between products. In, my, in your DMR, verifies that the devices are made per the validated recipe. Remember we talked about the cake. <clears throat> your DHR proves that you manufacture according to your DMR. Remember, if you take anything out of this webinar, what I want you to take out is that you, your DHR has to specifically reference sp procedures and characteristics. And last, your technical file. Your notified body will look at this. It will prove your compliance with the essential requirements and enable you to acquire or maintain your company's ISO certification and your uh, medical device directive compliance, your CE, product CE marketing. So that's the end of the webinar. I'd like to go ahead now and uh, have the moderator begin to take questions. Thank you uh, so much, Mr. Kassar, for the wonderful presentation, and also all the participants for cooperating with us. Now, uh, it's time for question and answers to begin, and the best way to ask any questions if you have is to click on palm-like uh, icon on your panel, and I will unmute your line so that you can put across your question directly to the speaker, and uh, we can get the answer. 
or else you can uh, send your questions to me by chat and I shall pass it on to our presenter to answer it. Uh, meanwhile, we sincerely request you to share your feedback in the feedback form that will appear on your screen in the polling panel shortly. The feedback question, ha the feedback form has just six questions, mostly multiple choice in nature, and it will not take more than two minutes of your time to answer. The polling will remain open till the end of the session, and you can answer it even after co after the questions uh, and answer session is over. We would be grateful if you could just stay back a little longer and complete this feedback for us. So, dear attendees, we are waiting for your questions. Please let us know if you have any. Mr. Kassov, I don't see any questions coming up from our attendees' end. However, let's uh, give, give them a few more seconds if they have any questions. Okay, so I don't see any questions. So, uh, uh, Mr. Kassov, do you have any final remarks for our attendees? Uh, just to reiterate that the importance of maintain, assuring that your DHR and DMR are compliance are in compliance with each other. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, uh, ladies, uh, sir, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are grateful to all of you for having taken part in this webinar. If you would like to get in touch with us, you can send us an email to webinars at Global Compliance Panel. And if any of you feel that your team members, colleagues, friends might benefit from this webinar, we are happy to inform you that it will be available in the recorded format. And you can uh, contact our customer support uh, and get this project done. You can call us back at 800-447-9407. And I would like to take this opportunity to let you know about the upcoming webinars of Mr. Jeff Kassoff. So if you need further information, please feel free to contact us. Uh, our customer support will be more than happy to provide you more information about the same. We welcome your suggestions and feedback or ideas on how we can improve our webinars. If you would like to suggest a topic or desire a customized corporate training, whether it is online or on-site, we ensure that whatever is your training necessity, it will be our priority. So we look forward to having you uh, with us again sometime soon for your continued patronage also. And on behalf of our presenter, Mr. Jeff Kassoff and Global Compliance Panel team, I would, like, I would like to say thank you for participating in this webinar and we wish you a pleasant day ahead.